as soon as the tech person tells us we're out. Okay, you're live. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us all today at our core speaker series event. We have a wonderful speaker today, Shannon Salter. Uh, Shannon is the chair of the Civil Tribunal, and uh, she earned her Bachelor of Arts and her Bachelor's of Laws from the University of British Columbia, her Master's of Laws from the University of Toronto. She clerked at the British Columbia Supreme Court litigation at a large Vancouver law firm for several years and has served as the vice chair of the Workers' Compensation Appeals Tribunal. Ms. Salter is also the com a commissioner for the Financial Institutions Commission, a vice president of the British Columbia Council of Administrative Tribunals, a, a past board member of the College of Registered Nurses of British Columbia, and teaches administration. So I, I will, with no further ado, hand this over to Walter. Uh, that you are aware, please hold all of your questions to the end. For those of you who are joining us uh, online, uh, email your questions in advance to coreclinic1 at gmail.com, or you can tweet them, hashtag core speaker. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. And I've just had a note from uh, from the core website. Is that correct, Sharon? Yes, the core website. And the, and, and the link is, if you're on the YouTube page, the link is in the body of the information underneath. OK, thank yeah. you. Well, thank you very much, Jacqueline. And thank you so much to CORE for having me today. I've been really looking forward to the presentation. Thank you to all of you who have uh, turned out today in person. And also a big hello to those of you who are joining us all, uh, all over the province. It's really Wonderful to be able to connect with you uh, through this medium. So today, a little bit about uh, the Civil Resolution Tribunal, and I'm going to give you a bit of a lay of the land and explain a little bit about where the CRT came from, why it is that the government decided to future look like, not just for the CRT, but also for the civil justice system in British Columbia and the justice system and alternative dispute resolution fit into the bigger picture. As Jacqueline mentioned, um, there will be a significant amount of time after the presentation for questions and discussion, and I'm really looking forward to hearing all of your views. Civil Resolution Tribunal. Well, in 2012, the government passed the Civil Resolution Tribunal Act and created jurisdiction for the tribunal over small claims matters and many strata disputes. And we've been saying this for a while, but when it does open later this year, it will be the first online tribunal in Canada. So a bit more information about jurisdiction. Many of you know that these disputes are claims that are $5,000 in uh, a variety of civil contract, uh, damages, recovery, property, success, performance, does. Um, however, the tribunal decide matters that affect the underlying interest in land and this is particularly relevant on the small uh, on the strata side so while the strata uh, the CRT will be able to adjudicate issues involving strata governance things like payment of fees or fines unfair actions uh, enforcement of strata bylaws repairs and common property meeting uh, governance issues the CRT will not be able to do things like uh, adjudicate the winding up of a strata corporation, appointing an administrator, anything that affects the underlying where strata disputes arise. So why the CRT? I was appointed in July, and uh, George became the Chief Justice of Ontario in September, and this quote from him really spoke to me as I was starting to really understand what the CRT was all about. And he said this on his very first day, in a few minutes in office. He said this upon being sworn in. He said, we built that it's become increasingly by its own procedures, reaching a point where we've begun to impede the very justice we're striving to protect. And that's true all over Canada. Uh, and it's also uh, true in British Columbia. And if we look at British Columbia in the small claims context, but also the general context, and I should note that many strata disputes <coughs> currently go to the BC Supreme Court. While you're able to resolve some disputes in the small claims court if they fall within small claims jurisdiction, the vast majority of issues dealing with governance, 
interpretation of bylaws, interpretation of the acts, the kind of day-to-day -day neighborhood disputes, have to go right now to the BC Supreme Court, uh, which all of you know who have been involved with the civil justice system, um, create some barriers. So here, here's what those, this sort of procedural burden that Mr. Justice Strathy was talking about in British Columbia. And, and I should note that in, um, in discussing this, I'm not, uh, I'm not casting blame on the judiciary. They're incredibly hardworking and committed. And this is nobody's fault. It's a systemic issue, and it's not unique to British Columbia. But we do know that in British Columbia, access, uh, rural parties have a particularly tough time. They might live hundreds of kilometers away from the nearest courthouse. They have to pay increased travel and often things, but also matters has increased over the past few years. And at the same time, the amount of support available to people navigating the system on their own is still very limited. Uh, and at the end of, uh, of all of these uh, barriers, and I'll return to this in a moment, very few cases actually go to trial. So the way our whole justice system is oriented is towards the day in court. We always talk about the day in court. But realistically, only 2 to 3% of civil cases in the BC Supreme Court ever actually make it to trial. And in the small claims court, it's, it's more than that, but not a ton more. So we've oriented the entire civil justice system towards this day in court, which for many people will never come. And as lawyers, we like to talk about how, well, this means just all these cases settle on the courtroom staff. But we know that that's not true. We know that people run out of money, they become discouraged and frustrated, and uh, evidence disappears and goes away, and these cases trail off. But it doesn't mean that the result, the dispute, actually gets resolved. A study underway in British Columbia to look at that issue. Where do all these cases go that don't go to trial? So uh, moving on to the next uh, tranche here, I'm right now, if you claims uh, action, you are looking at 12 to 18 months for a trial date, depending on where you are in the province. Again, people in rural communities generally experience more delay than people in urban centers, but in any event, uh, 12 to 18 months. We know for some strata disputes, this can be longer depending on the complexity. It can be also shorter if it's a one-day petition. And in both courts, we have delays and backlogs. In terms of costs, I've talked about travel costs. There's also other hidden costs, so childcare, um, arranging your life around having to be somewhere that may not be close to you at a particular time and place. Especially for uh, strata disputes, legal fees can be quite uh, A strata lawyer recently told me that a one-day petition in, in a BC Supreme Court is between ten and $15,000 in legal fees. And that's just for one side. There's also court costs, so the, the fees that the courts uh, charge as hearing fees on top of that. So what do we get at the end of this access and cost and delay? Well, in, in my view, what we get is really a lack of proportionality. We have a one-size-fits-all process. So if you have a court case, uh, you're following the same regardless of how big or small your case is, how sophisticated or unsophisticated the parties might be, how much evidence there is. It's a one all solution because it's geared to a trial date. And judges, by their nature, have to be experts in a variety of areas. So in the provincial court, uh, provincial court judges do criminal matters 60% of the time. They do family matters a bunch of the time, and then they also do small cases. So you could have a provincial court judge who um, does a murder trial, for instance, one day, the next day having to adjudicate a $500 hardwood floor case. And uh, perhaps it might be um, a better use of resources There's can be adjudicating those issues, freeing up judicial resources for other areas which really do need that high level of judicial uh, expertise. As I mentioned, the focus on trial dates means that there's really quite little alternative dispute resolution importing more mediation in the claims court process. And that pilot program it's odd to call it a pilot because it's been around for so long, um, but it's been very successful. And the experience of that pilot program and the success that Mediate BC has had um, is foundational to the idea of that if you front load alternative dispute resolution, you can 
um, reap all sorts of benefits, which I'll talk about in a moment. But to summarize, really these access to justice barriers combined with a win-lose outcome, I win, you lose, you lose, I win. I think I won both times there. Um, but a zero-sum approach to conflict resolution has led to a great deal of citizen dissatisfaction. And it's interesting because if you ask people about their views on the justice system in Canada, they actually tend to have a pretty positive response statistically. They think it's pretty good. Until you ask people who have actually had a case go through the justice system. And then their satisfaction level with our justice system generally really takes a nosedive because they've experienced it firsthand. Um, and so it's, it's a metaphor, but it really is like this square peg in a round hole. We're asking people to fit into a justice system that was really built around um, the needs of traditional justice actors, lawyers, judges, uh, court staff, and it's been that way for many hundreds of years. But what the CRT is questioning, I think, is does it have to be that way? Is that the only way that our justice system can operate? Uh, a, re a report that came out late last year by the National Action Committee on Civil and Family Justice had one overriding principle, and this is a committee of Canada, and uh, they undertook quite a long um, period of, of study and reflection, and their report had one basic principle, which is that access to justice can only be improved if we put the public first. If we ask ourselves, whose justice system is it anyway? Who does this belong to? If we were to design a justice system today, with all the tools that we have and everything that we know about people's lives, would it look like the existing brick and mortar justice system, or is there an opportunity to do things a bit differently? And groups of lawyers, and I'm a lawyer myself, so I, I feel that I can be a little bit critical of my own profession here, but um, I think as lawyers, we tend to have a very unhealthy attachment to the idea of precedent. So we learn from the first day of law school that is the most important thing, that what happened in the past should dictate the future. Our entire legal system is based on that. And that's yielded us some really amazing principles, foundational principles like the rule of law and procedural fairness. It's difficult for us as a profession to embrace change in areas where maybe we should be a bit more open-minded, a little bit less attached to the past. And so when I'm speaking with, with groups of lawyers in particular, I, I encourage us as a profession to try and divide for a moment the principles that are foundational to our justice system and the process by which we give effect to those principles. The principles are important. They're, they're incredibly important. But do we need to give effect to them in the same way we always have before? And if we're able to create those two things, does it free us to really uh, have a bit of a blank slate procedurally and figure out how do we build this little corner of the justice system from the ground up way that's designed for people, for the realities of their work, for childcare, their education level, where they happen to live, what's important to them. Do we not have an opportunity to bring them to them, to go to where they are, instead of forcing them to bend over backwards a system that's not easily accommodating them? So, so that's sort of the thinking behind the CRT. And in, in thinking this way, if you think about how do you put the public first, we've come up with five key principles. And I'll talk about how it'll actually work in a moment. But in terms of principles, we're trying to make it as timely as possible. So focusing on early resolution, getting people uh, into the CRT and out of it as quickly as possible. But in any event, even if people are not able to settle their dispute early and have to go all the way through to adjudication, that should not take years of their lives. It should be a 60-day process in most cases. And we know from social science research that the longer people have a conflict that festers, and all of you know this in your uh, practice, no doubt, as well, the longer that that festers, the longer people are in conflict, the longer they have uh, a case in the justice system, the more negatively it impacts not just their financial health, but their emotional and mental well-being as well. So we need to focus on early conflict resolution and get people through putting the public first because we're offering people a range of alternative dispute resolution choices. So they will have the option to negotiate, then uh, they will have the option to go through the negotiation process, and at the end if they're not able to resolve their conflict through those processes, 
there's adjudication as a last resort, and the tribunal will issue a binding decision that's enforceable in court. Flexibility is not just with respect to the parties. We know that as a CRT, we have to be flexible as well, and we have continuous improvement. And that's a key uh, message that I'd like to come back to in a little while, because this is innovative, yes, but it's also because of that um, new. And so we know it's not going to work perfectly right out of the box. We know we have to be flexible ourselves, that we're going to have to learn, that we're going to have to ask for we're going to have to be very agile in, in incorporating that. So in terms of accessibility, the tribunal will be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, anywhere where you have an internet connection. Um, and the front end of the tribunal, which is something that we're calling a solution explorer, and I'll talk about that as well, to offer free public legal information and support that um, you will not have to the CRT to use that any consequence or expenditure of money on their to explore their dispute resources to find out a little bit more and to understand uh, their issue a bit better uh, the fourth box there the red box is affordability so in total, our aim is to make the CRT process cost about what the small claims court does now, which is about $200 once you add in the notice of claim and reply. That's our aim. It's not been set in stone, but it will be on that. But uh, fees will be staged. So if you're able to resolve your dispute earlier in the process, for instance, at the facilitation stage, you'll pay less than it goes through to the adjudicative stage. Uh, usually there'll be no travel or legal fees because it will be accessible remotely. Um, and there will be fee exemptions for people for whom it would uh, be a financial hardship to pay those fees. And this is built into the legislation from 2012, and it really echoes with Canada's decision in the Trial Lawyers Association case that came down a couple of months ago. But this has been built into the Act since 2012. Last but not least, we're trying to make this a, as efficient as possible devoting resources at the front end to do early case management and by tailoring timelines and processes to the case. So if you have a dispute and the only evidence in your dispute is a two-page contract, maybe you don't need three weeks on either side to be exchanging documents. Maybe we can tailor a timeline that will get you through the process more efficiently. And by the same token, if you do have a more complicated case, we can design timelines that will fit the needs of those parties as well. Wherever possible, we're trying to avoid duplication. So we know that people have difficulty with government forms. And uh, there was a study that came out that said that half of people with post-secondary educations cannot fill out correctly a fairly brief government form. And I don't mean to sound uh, condescending with that because I fall into that category. Um, and anybody who's had anything bounced as a reg at the registry and as a lawyer is a humbling experience. But um, you can imagine that for somebody who isn't familiar with the system and may have additional barriers, linguistic or other barriers, this is, this is actually a pretty big deal. So we are asking people for information. We're going to ask, it, ask for it one time, and we're going to carry it through the whole process. And we're working with plain language specialists to make sure that our forms are truly plain language. And I've told a couple of times to other audiences, but... We've launched an implementation site, uh, civilresolutionec.ca, there's my plug. And in preparing the content for that site, we really tried to get as plain language as possible. I wrote a lot of the content for that uh, with some colleagues in Victoria, and I would write what I thought was a plain language uh, post. And then I would send it to Victoria, who, Lisa, who is a, um, much better at this than I am, and she would rewrite it in a way that was actually plain language. And it was, it was humbling to realize how difficult it is to get out of your own um, language context. And so we are going to not do that. We're going to delegate that to the experts to make sure that it truly is plain language and accessible to people. Okay, so you're thinking, well, those are nice principles, but how is this actually going to work? How do you make give effect to these kinds of principles? Um, and this, in a nutshell, is it describes how the tribunal will work. So there'll be four... Uh, distinct phases to the tribunal. You can see that the at the top, if you're following along um, online, you'll see in the slides, and I'm pointing here, but the dispute volumes are really front-loaded at the beginning stages. And so we're hopeful that people um, will use the, what we're calling the Solution Explorer here 
to find out information about their problem, to get some tools to help solve it on their own, um, and that dispute volumes will decrease as people move through the system where adjudication is really a, a last resort. It's not where the muscle of the tribunal is. The muscle of the tribunal is earlier. Um, so the first box, as I mentioned, is the Solution Explorer, and I'll show you a little bit about that in a moment. The second box here is negotiation. This is a very light phase of the tribunal. It's really an opportunity just to put people together and shave off that small, small, uh, small minority of disputes that can be resolved by, for instance, working at a payment plan or just putting people together uh, in a virtual room. But really, the heart of the tribunal, I think, is in this third box, and that's the case management and facilitated ADR case. So this is where a facilitator will work with the parties to try and reach a nego uh, um, an agreement, a consensual agreement. And if that doesn't work, they will work with the parties for adjudication by um, explaining what the process is and what to expect from adjudication. And this is a, a feature that really doesn't exist in many areas of our traditional court system. As I mentioned, adjudication will be a valued last resort. I won't spend too much time on that because for those of you who are familiar with administrative tribunals, it won't be that different. The law requires that administrative decision making happens in a particular way. However, we will be able to use electronic tools to make it easier for people to um, engage in the adjudication phase. At the bottom here of the slide, you'll see all the communication methods that we'll use at each state of the, stage of the tribunal. And one thing I wanted to point out is that um, really when people enter the tribunal, which happens at this stage, at the negotiation stage onward, we're able to provide tribunal services through mail. So one question I get a lot of the time is, well, what about people who are not comfortable with technology or unable or unwilling to use it? And I'll talk about this a bit more in a moment, but we are able to revert to more traditional ways of um, serving people through a tribunal uh, for, the, for people who um, don't, don't, can't easily access technology. So initially the tribunal will be voluntary, mostly because there is one key. Strata councils under the Act participate in the tribunal if they're so by another party. For everybody else, it will be voluntary. So you can invite somebody to participate, uh, to use the CRT to resolve your dispute. If you choose not to do that, then you're left with going to the Supreme Court for, for strata disputes, small claims court for small claims matters. As I mentioned, the processes will be very flexible, uh, uh, and I've talked about that. But one of the key factors this approach is interactions, and that's a bit jargony. But all that really means is that you don't have to be in the same place at the same time. So if you're somebody who has a full-time job and you come home and take care of your kids or you have other obligations, you can work on your dispute from your computer, from your tablet, after the kids are in bed, at a time when you can think and have some time to consider and, and it's convenient for you. Similarly, if you're somebody who does shift work or works on the weekend, can fit this in around your own schedule because we're not requiring people to be, for the most part, in the same place at the same time. So there'll be a mix of, of service channels, which just means communication, but we won't be leaving anyone behind. So in my, in my view, this is a really important access to justice project, but you can't have an access to justice project think about what that means in real terms in a moment, um, but that is part of our ethos. We'll offer telephone support if people need it uh, at any time along the way. Um, and we'll offer support in other ways too, and I'll talk about that. The four boxes I showed you at the beginning was this thing we're calling a solution explorer. And really all it is is of guided questions and answers. We know now, uh, having um, some good research in this area, that it's not good enough to say that you're providing online legal information by just scanning a bunch of PDFs and throwing them up on your website. It doesn't actually help people very much because what they need is targeted bits of information that are geared towards their specific dispute. And in order to find out what pieces of information they need, you need to ask them questions. And so the solution is to operate in that way. People will pick their area of dispute the Solution Explorer will ask, and then along the way, we'll provide tools and templates and, uh, and give them 
they better understand their problem and they're better able to tackle it themselves. Choose, they can also enter the CRT through that process. And what I'm showing you is very truncated because if I took you through an entire screen of questions and answers, it would take about 20 minutes by itself. So where we are right now is a screen about three or four questions in. And the person, the member of the public has um, answered some questions already that they have a strata dispute and that the strata council is asking them to pay some money and that their request is for a bylaw fine or penalty. And before I get to uh, this, uh, this further question, I wanted to point out a couple of things about this process. So the Solution Explorer doesn't store any personal information. It's complete, it's also expensive to store that information. But we also didn't want to risk that people who just are trying to explore our problem um, would, could be construed as evidence that would then have to be disclosed in the CRT process. So what this is is really a consequence-free way to just explore your problem and get information. So um, because of that, uh, it doesn't people can take a break back to it. Again, designing around people's lives. We give people an access code that they can enter it in again anytime within 30 days and pick up where they left. If they're interrupted or they need to find more information or they just need a break to think. So in this page here, um, and I've, I've talked about how the, this issue is about a strata fine. Um, asking why are you disputing the finer penalty? Is it the amount is inappropriate? Is it that the process was wrong? Or is it that I didn't do anything wrong and this, this whole fine um, should never have been in the first place? Or is it none of the above? So if people pick none of the above, they're taken to another page where they can get telephone support or um, other resources. They can also pick more than one uh, options. And those of, all of you no doubt have experienced cases in conflict resolution sessions where someone says, yeah, I, not only was the fine inappropriate, but you followed the wrong process didn't do anything wrong. So all of these things. So in this um, in this system, you can check more than one of these uh, these issues, and then the Solution Explorer takes you down one path, and then we start again for your next issue. So at the end, you'd get a summary of all of your issues. Um, on the the top uh, left hand corner, there's a little, or sorry, right hand corner, there's a little blue box that says Help. Have any of you used TurboTax to file your taxes or something like that? You file? At least one of you have. I suspect more than one of you have. Um, and if you use a, a program like that and you click the help button, what pops up is not just 200 questions uh, generally about the Solution Explorer. What pops up are the top three questions about this particular page. And the system knows that if people have questions about this page, it tends to be one of these three things, for example. And so it's constantly with the latest uh, information about tailored to this page. Uh, there's a progress bar at the top. Uh, people can continue, they can um, skip over this, there's a lot of flexibility. Okay, so we've gone through this page. This is an example of what somebody would be offered going through this degree. So you've told us you've got this bylaw fine and you're disputing it. Here's a moment to pause and give you some information. So here are, and you'll uh, see this that will pull, to give people a link to the app. Nobody wants to read through hundreds of provisions. So what we're giving people, for example, here, is the two or three sections that deal directly with their issue. And we're also asking them to get a copy of their strata bylaws and any letters that the strata has sent them. And this will enable them to answer subsequent questions. But they can skip this, they can download it, they can print it. Um, most importantly, probably for them, they can rate this really easily. So this is a way for us to do continuous improvement as well. Because if this page continuously gets a one or two, we know it's a dud back and look at it and we, we need to do something better. If it's getting good good ratings, then we can pat ourselves on the back and, and move on. This is um, another example of a resource. And it's a template letter to the Strata account. So I found often in my pro bono work, people would come into my office for a half hour appointment and they would have a dispute and the only um, option they thought was available to them was to small claims court or otherwise. And even those who thought about writing um, a letter to the strata or dealing directly with the strata, they often didn't know what to use. They didn't know the sections of the act or to hire a lawyer to write the letter, but they didn't feel confident doing it themselves. So what we're providing people with here is a way, an in-text editor, they can fill it 
the information particular to them, but it already has the about the act and why they're disputing the fine that's particular to their kind of So people can edit this or they can skip it all together, they can email it to themselves or they can print it off, or they can tell us, you know, this is really great or this is really terrible, it's still too complicated. This out. These are all questions that we're going to find out uh, operating. At the end of their, this is very, very truncated, what they'll get is a summary of their claims. So, um, on claim one, it's giving them, it's you know, repeating the information they've given us and giving them some legal information about where they stand. Um, it's listing the resources them along the way, the template letter, uh, the chat they can go back to. And then it's giving them what I call a bit of a breadcrumb trail. So if the information they're getting here doesn't really make sense, it doesn't seem to fit with, their, with what they think they've told us, they can look at the answers they've given us and, and say, okay, I see where this will need to go back and put a different piece of information in. So people can go off and use these resources or they can enter into the uh, tribunal process. And that's the green button down on the right hand corner. And then they're taken into the second box, the negotiation phase. So again, going back to the four boxes that I showed you. This frankly doesn't take a lot of resources on our part, and but it gives the participants an opportunity to avoid spending more time and money on their dispute. Um, this also doesn't add any time to the process because it happens at the same time as intake. So while they're waiting in a queue to the facilitation phase, they're offered this opportunity to negotiate and we um, help them do that in a reasonably little, limited, you know, pragmatic. So the third box though, I think is really, as I said, the heart of the tribunal. And this is probably where all of you would get a little bit more interested because this is your, um, your work and your area of expertise. So at the facilitation uh, stage, a case manager slash facilitator, uh, the role uh, wears two hats, and we'll talk about that in a minute too, works with the parties to reach a consensual agreement. And this is a very flexible process. So one of the reasons we're not calling this mediation is because for some of you, what this process is would not qualify um, in the way that you might define mediation. It's a very flexible dispute resolution process. And when we were working through the technology to figure out how do you design that lets people do this, we realized that the best thing is just to get out of the way, to let the uh, technology provide the tools, the communication tools that the facilitator will need, and then just to hire really great people who have excellent skills in this area to do what they do best, which is to assess the dispute to understand the parties and their needs, and to figure out what process might work best for these uh, the particular dispute they're dealing with. So a facilitator, for instance, in this area of the tribunal, won't get a giant checklist of 100 steps on a particular schedule. Instead, we're really going to be um, trusting their judgment and their skills to be able to use the communication tools available them, to them to help people resolve their disputes. And this can happen asynchronously or synchronously, so it can happen through email or text or video conference if that works better. Um, the facilitator can resolve some or all of the disputes, and with the consent of the parties, the Act provides that the can decide the dispute and that that decision can be turned into a binding tribunal order. So, as I said, very flexible. And, and really more of a med art model uh, compared to a traditional mediation art uh, model. So what will the outcome of facilitation be? Well, if the parties are able to agree, then uh, the facilitator can get a quick order from a tribunal member. So it, the, the draft agreement will hop this virtual fence, a tribunal member will get to an order of the tribunal, and that will become enforceable in court. If there's no agreement, then the role of the facilitator or case manager changes into more of a case manager role where they are providing support to the parties to prepare for adjudication. And of course, they need to do this in a very neutral way, in an information giving way. They are not advocates on the part of one or uh, other size, but they can explain what to expect from adjudication, how the role of an adjudicator is different from that of a facilitator. Um, what the parties, the steps the parties will need to take to prepare themselves for adjudication in terms of gathering evidence, uh, preparing arguments, and, and where they can go for more support in doing that. 
So we're, helping, we're hoping that that process will help narrow the, the issues and organ, help people organize their claims so that when the matter goes to adjudication, you're avoiding extra delays on that side. I mentioned I wasn't going to spend much time on adjudication, and I won't, because as I said, it, it's, it's very similar to what is going on in administrative tribunals all over the province right now. Uh, the adjudication will be done by part-time tribunal members, and actually the posting for that position uh, will be on the board resourcing and development website either later today or tomorrow, uh, is my understanding. And so we are looking for applications who would like to serve as part-time tribunal members. And the full details of that position are available on the board resource site. Or if you know of somebody who you think would be a good candidate, please encourage them all over the province. So the benefit of being able to do this remotely is that we can draw upon expertise outside of this. We can um, go to wherever the, the best and brightest people are uh, to do this work. This will primarily be in written form, just as they are with many uh, administrative tribunals in BC. There will be some telephone or video hearings where the requirements of administrative law uh, necessitate that. So where there's issues of credibility or complexity available. Written reasons will be brief. And we're thinking sort of four to five pages in general rather than 30 pages. And this is part of how we, um, we meet this proportionality requirement. So the adjudicators are going to have to be concise, but they're going to have to offer sound, well-reasoned decisions uh, that are uh, reasonably brief. More detailed reasons uh, are going to be available on request and, and that will be ne necessary for people who are seeking judicial review, for example. Decisions are enforceable, uh, so tribunal decisions are enforceable as court orders or court decisions. And in terms of an appeal process, it's likely going to be a bifurcated appeal process. So appeals from small claims decisions will go to the BC Provincial Court, to so the Small Claims Court, and what you'll have is essentially a new trial at that stage. This is likely how it will work. On the strata claim side, those um, appeals will be in the nature of a judicial review, and that will go to the BC Supreme Court. Um, and the judicial review process there will be quite similar to what's in place for administrative tribunals in most cases generally. So coming full circle then, having described the process, how are we actually achieving what we say we want to achieve, which is putting the public first? Well, really, I think the heart of this is empowering people with choice. Choice about where, when, and how they resolve their disputes, putting them in the center of that process rather than outside of it, and doing that by making it accessible, giving people choices about dispute resolution methods, giving them the support that they need to use these methods by assigning them a dedicated case manager or facility who will work with them not just in a limited period of time, but potentially over days, if that's necessary, uh, to help them resolve their disputes, and if necessary, help them prepare for adjudication. Support will be available and in and out of the process quickly so that they can move on with their lives. And last but not least, we're committed to continuous feedback and improvement. This is a work in progress. It's a work in progress now, but it will be a work in progress during the first and first to using the tribunal. And some of the questions I, I often get are what are unwilling or unable to use the technology? And that paper and telephone based services will be available. But this isn't just an afterthought. I mean, in, de in designing the process, we realized that it's really not serving anybody's interest to take, you know, that member of, the, of your family that you know, and I'm thinking of a member of my family right now, who is really resistant or unable or scared by technology and forcing them onto a technology platform um, that they're not comfortable with. So what happens if you try and force somebody to do that is that they get frustrated, uh, the tribunal will get frustrated, whoever's helping them will get frustrated, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. So in cases, for example, where, um, say, somebody who is, is really only comfortable with phone and mail is in a dispute with a talking texter, um, Instead of the facilitator having to translate all those text messages or emails and then put them into mail or phoning the other side, the most sensible uh, solution in that case is to go to the lowest common technological denominator. So a facilitator in that circumstance would not force the use of technology. Instead, the, most, the quickest and most painless thing for everybody is probably if he or she just picked up the phone and had a telephone conference with the parties. Right? 
So it's about being flexible. It's, it's about using the technology where it makes sense and it serves people's interests um, and not using it where it doesn't. And that's going to be a matter of judgment for, for everybody concerned. What happens if there are problems with the technology? And of course, everybody can think of examples where perhaps a government technology project has worked as you would have expected it to work. Uh, we're taking in a lot of mitigation steps to try to minimize that from happening. But, um, you know, there will be glitches out of the box. This is not going to work perfectly. And that's part of the reason that it's voluntary. So um, people always will have resort, uh, resort to the traditional justice system if, if they need to. But that's not good enough for our purposes. And we are trying to make sure that uh, we're mitigating those risks at every corner. And I spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, and it's something I can go into in more detail if you'd like in your questions. Um, but the answer is in a hurry. So people are not particularly <coughs> interested in the technical answers. But I, they are there if you're interested. What about people who want to use a lawyer or support person? Well, a person is free to have a lawyer or support person or legal advice all the way through this process. <coughs> the one exception is in Section 20 of the Act, there is a provision that creates a presumption of self-representation. And people, um, people are entitled in, in the case of an oral hearing to have a lawyer if they're a minor or they have capacity issues or if the tribunal determines it's in the interest of justice. But that only applies to an oral hearing, or a telephone or video hearing. So it doesn't apply to written hearings. It doesn't apply to any of these processes along the way. You could have a lawyer advising you throughout that process. You could have a trusted friend or family member helping you throughout that process. There's no limit on any of that, which we anticipate will be quite rare. Um, but again, there are these categories of exceptions, and one of them is whether it's in the and, and my view is that that needs to be read very well, that um, if, if somebody really does need representation and they're not able to capably represent themselves, then that's something that needs to permit because it would be in the interest of justice. So on more particular issues, though, what can we do to remove barriers, including linguistic barriers, accessibility barriers, technological barriers? So I'm about to go through now what we are doing about those things, but it's not the end of the story, and we recognize that. Um, so we, we are working with uh, different advocacy groups around the province. We had some with um, advocacy groups that assist clients who are low income, who um, have other barriers to accessing the justice system. We're working with them to make sure that we can identify ways to break down those barriers. And we're developing some tools out of those focus groups to help. So. Um, this is an active dialogue that we're engaged in, and it's part of our commitment to continuous improvement, that we go back and ask how we're doing, and try and incorporate that feedback wherever we can. In terms of language, we recognize that a, a good percentage of British speak English as a first language, and we will be offering telephone interpretation for free in a variety of languages uh, for hearings. And right now in the provincial court, if you, and if you need that's something that you have to pay for on your own. Uh, the tribunal will be providing the service for free. Um, and that was something that seemed to really um, be important to some of the advocacy groups that we talked to who deal primarily with clients who don't speak English as a first language. We'll also be creating multilingual guides and resources. We won't be able to translate the entire website into different languages. And the reason for that is that it's very, very expensive to keep that up. And there's a danger that if we don't uh, do the upkeep across all the languages exactly at the same time, people might have different information. So what we do, though, is provide multiple resources and really be flexible in our tribunal procedures to ensure fairness wherever we can and to assist people where we can. In terms of the technology, I've, I've spoken a bit about that uh, already. Uh, we are working with PovNet, uh, and these are the focus groups I was mentioning, but one of the things at is what about uh, older people? What about people in remote province? And um, we're scheduling a focus group in Fort St. John, particularly to talk to resource and advocacy groups up there. In terms of disability, we're building into the technology best practices for web disability. And uh, more than that, and this, this really applies to, to people with any kind of barrier, we're trying to make the tribunal a really welcoming and supportive place for advocates. And I know from talking to Adfield, when they engage in the administrative justice sector or the justice sector 
And so we're trying to find ways that we can make it easy for them to help the people they need to help, whether they're advocacy groups or whether it's just an individual help family or a friend through this process. And of course, there will be a dedicated case manager or facilitator to help support the parties, to identify where barriers might exist and try and support people. Um, and we're really, tar I'm, I'm really quick focused on ensuring that there's training for those individuals to be able to do that job properly. So briefly, and I, I know I'm hammering this point, but it, it really is important. We're really committed to asking for feedback and advice, to listening to that feedback, and to incorporating what we can. And we do have a limited budget. We have limited resources. But I, I have become aware that there are things we can do that go quite a distance to breaking down barriers, to making uh, government programs more accessible, or tribunals more accessible, in this case, that don't actually cost tons and tons of money. But it's treating people with respect and dignity and identifying ways that we can do all of that better. Committed to doing that. So where are we now? The conceptual designs for the tribunal. Um, that's kind of like building the blueprint so that you know you jump into building and, and get to the third floor and realize you have no bathroom. We've done the blueprints and we've worked with other tribunals. We've selected a technology partner uh, and they will be building this, uh, this platform for us. We're hiring key staff, so we have a registrar and executive director now. Um, we launched the implementation site, which I'll plug again at the end. Um, and now we're heading into really developing the business processes and the rules and appointing adjudicators, hiring case managers, integrate <laughs> both sides together uh, so that the human um, side and the business process side, which I'm primarily responsible for, integrates with the technology side, which is the government's responsibility to build. And that's a bit of a moving target. Uh, but we want to be prepared so that we can launch as soon as possible. And I'm getting emails every day asking when we're opening, when we're launching. I haven't got a single email saying, I don't like this idea. <laughs> really, it's about, can I give you my, my, my evidence now? Can I be on a waiting list? So we know that the need is out there. We know there's a lot of unmet need. And we're working really hard to launch this as soon as possible. And I, I told you I'd tell you how this would impact the future. And the CRT is, is an experiment, and it's a new model for how you can reconfigure this little corner of the justice system. But if it works, it really will pioneer a different approach, um, focusing on public choice and, and service, increasing access to justice. And this model will be applied across the administrative justice sector in the coming years. So you'll see more and more tribunals coming on to the kind of technology platform I've described, and also putting the focus on early dispute resolution. And uh, yeah, and, and so that's the lay of the land <coughs> in the next uh, five to 10 years. And I promised you that uh, questions to the end, that there will be lots of time for questions, and I think we're on track for that. We should be good. We've got, um, um, I'm gonna stand up and just, because this is part of reminding everybody, when you do have a question, we're gonna ask you to come up here. Um, so that you are picked up by the mic so that the online audience is able to participate. Um, but yeah, we've got about half an hour for questions and I'm starting to get some online ones. So maybe I'll start with an online one since I'm already standing here. I go back and forth. I've got four of them already from the online audience Great. but we'll invite somebody up. And just... um, so I'm going to start. The first one I received was from Dan Williams. And um, Shannon, he wanted to know um, about if it was going to be the telephone support that you were talking about, um, and I believe in connection primarily with the Solution Explorer mm -hmm. component, was going to be 24-7 as well. That's a good question, and I think the answer realistically is probably not. But that is something I can find more information about. There are a lot of uh, question marks, despite how, how polished and well yeah. thought out my presentation <laughs> was. Um, there are a lot of question marks. We don't know the answers to everything yet. We're still making operational decisions. So that's something I can find more information about, but um, I think it's probably unlikely given the kind of resources we have. There will be a hold of people though and to get support, so either online um, through this interactive help feature. And uh, you know that's something that we're, we know that people will, especially initially need help uh, navigating through this process and, and we are focused on that, so. Do you want to come up? I want people for you, Shannon. Sure. And I want me to be. Just anywhere up here okay. so you're picked up. I mean, you can be. Okay. Lee, if you step in front, Lee. Lee Turnbull. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll 
I'm, I'm interested in power balancing. For example, suppose we have somebody who is not friendly, and they have a dispute, and they, on the other side, there is somebody who's very technology. That get, will get dealt with by the case managers, I guess, is probably the first time he's noticed that. And what kind of safeguards you have built in? For example, the justice system. You know, the, I think they intervene to assist with that when it happens at trial. So that's my question. That, that's a good question. And admittedly, I sometimes pick up on those kinds of cues in an online environment. Um, but there is starting to be um, <coughs> some sense of best practices in, the, in that, that area. That's an area where training and excellent case managers are going to be really crucial. So we need to have people who are alive to that and to help identify it and also trained to be able to intervene where necessary. And that intervention can take different forms. It can obviously um, take the form of, of clarifying expectations in enforcing a rigorous code of conduct in that environment. But also, frankly, if, um, if in the facilitator's view, this is not a case that's um, amenable to facilitation, power imbalance, or, or one of those um, kind of other situations, they can expedite that to adjudication. So I, mean, I think many of you will, will recognize that there are situations that are not amenable to mediation or facilitation um, because of power imbalances or other issues that if you're not able to correct, um, they can also expedite that. And that's part of being able to tailor the process to the parties and the nature of, dis of the dispute. But you're right, the first step is identifying it. And that would require very good training on our part. And um, and on the parts of other other organizations that we may partner with, for instance, Mediate BC or others. We've got online. Um, the question is, who are the facilitators, the case managers, mediators, others, staff of CRT, which I think gives you a chance to kind of talk about what is the background? Sure. And again, we don't have all of that 100% ironed out, although I can tell you that there will be a core uh, group of staff case managers. Um, some may be part-time, some may be full-time. There may also be contract uh, case managers, and that may happen through, again, media ABC or uh, goodies um, in a very um, statistically rigorous way of case volumes. And so my aim is to make the tribunal as scalable as possible so that we can adapt to pretty um, rapid increases in case volumes or contract if we need to as well. And part of being a mix of full-time staff, part-time staff, and also contract uh, case managers and facilitators. In terms of the qualifications for that role, it's going to be a very unique role because on one hand, the person will have to manage a pretty significant caseload, be able to triage, um, uh, not get overwhelmed by the administrative part of that, but at the same time, they have to have first-rate facilitation and conflict resolution skills. And so uh, we're looking for, you know, obviously any experience with online dispute resolution is an asset. Experience with areas in the subject matter of the tribunals would be an asset. Uh, we're working on the job profile for that position right now, but likely uh, we won't be hiring for that position in great numbers uh, until closer to implementation. Those jobs um, or those positions, once they are uh, available, on the public service agency's website, and they, it may be that some of that um, that those positions are hired internally first because of government hiring hiring regulations. I anticipate that positions we will need to hire externally for because, as I say, the, the skill set is so unique. So I hope that answers the question. Okay. Other questions in the room? Um, hi, thanks a lot. It's really great to hear about it a little bit more. You mentioned that it's voluntary. Is that going to be ongoing as a voluntary or is it voluntary for a, a time period? And then the thought is, depending on the uptake, it could become the only, like the way. <coughs> right. And so it will come about at some point in the future, but uh, for the foreseeable future anyway, for this period, it will be, it will be voluntary. Or at least voluntary <coughs> except for startup corporations. I have one that, again, it might be a little bit related, um, but Julie Gibson is writing from Nanaimo and is just asking, um, what makes this different to the management initiatives, and why is it important as an addition to dispute resolution options for parties? Okay, so a two-part question. 
So why, what makes it different? What makes it different than, um, from the mandatory mediation um, initiatives that are out there? And is it important to dispute resolution parties? Sure. So we know from the pilot programs that Media ABC has done that that model has been very successful. But it still has some limitations because it's anchored by time and place, and it's only available in certain registries throughout the province. So why this model is important is because we're, we're building on the success of that program and the fact that it demonstrably takes uh, many uh, cases away from adjudication, and but we're trying to bring it to everybody. So uh, compensating for the fact that people live in remote areas of the province, they may not live close to a courthouse. It may be challenging for them to take time off work or arrange childcare or other obligations to be in a particular time in a particular place. So this really brings that model to everybody. We're trying to uh, spread that model because it does work to make it more readily available for people and easier for them to access. Uh, and, and frankly, we're building in more flexibility too so that we're giving the facilitators a statutory authority to do things that they may not be able to do under a, under a mandatory mediation. Mm -hmm. yeah, sir. yeah, I have two questions. Um, from your point of view, what would the advantage be to a litigant to change path opposed to going path to a judge to provincial court? Uh, well, depending on where you are and what else is going on in your life, I think the flexibility affords, it, it affords is paramount. So the fact that you can do this in your living room if you need to, you can do it from a coffee shop, um, certainly in terms of money. We know that 90% of people at small claims court are unrepresented. Represented, you don't get a ton of support navigating the system. And this isn't just British Columbia, this is in general. I think the advantages are, there's a number of advantages. There's cost advantages, there's ease of access advantages, there's an increased amount of support, there's people working with you at different stages, and, and if you're somebody who doesn't speak English as a first language, the fact that you have that support in other languages and that paid interpretive support in a hearing context are all clear advantages. On the strata side, the, the advantages are magnified because of the increased costs associated with the DC Supreme Court. Now, the second is, um, is there a financial limit to the, the, the size of a case, or is, is this only sort of small claims and strata? So the in, in terms of subject claims and strata, okay. on the small claims side, the monetary jurisdiction 25. is 25. Right. On the strata side, there isn't that monetary jurisdiction limit. So you can have claims on the strata side that are above 25,000. Quite a lengthy question here, um, and I'm wondering if it might be easier if I hand you my phone and let you read it, okay. so that you can process it as well as you're reading. Sure. Because I'm just thinking if I read it, okay. it might actually be worse than if. Uh, okay. So you mentioned private and undocumented mediation can be very harmful in scenarios where one party is insistent and not telling the truth. Example: Imagine a person going to extreme lengths to get people and resources to corroborate one large false story. In this scenario, let's say the truth seeker has documented records to help show what the truth is, which the other party wasn't aware of. This would also show that many people who were willing to cooperate in this false story would also be exposed as well. Um, by showing this proof in an undocumented mediation session, the other party is now aware of the type of proof that would clearly demonstrate they are telling a false story. As a result, this now gives them an opportunity to craft a new story with different people. This can simply deny, they can now simply deny any claims or remarks they made during the mediation as the process continues. Basically, it's on the truth seeking process and increases the chance that the false story will prevail. How would a civil resolution tribunal prevent these kinds of abuses that are prevalent within the current justice system, at least in small claims court and its pre trial process? Um, so, yeah, I'm sure there's so, going to be answers from some of the mediators in the room, yeah, for sure, and, as well. And, but. And, and the mediators in the room may be better placed to answer that question than, than I am. But, you know, as Mr. Yu points out, this truth and falsity is, is the heart of what the justice system is trying to discern, right? The whole process is geared towards figuring out what the truth is. And uh, there's definitely conflicting stories and, and studies about how well it does that. Um, and, and this is something I'm sure mediators have to deal with every every day, and I know lawyers and judges do. We do have safeguards along the way. Um, we, for instance, in the adjudicative context, require people to swear an oath to tell the truth. And that combined with findings of credibility, cross-examination, testing testing people's evidence, 
and corroborating it with other evidence that's not based on their oral testimony are the ways we, we can do that. And it's, it's like people say about democracy, it's not uh, a perfect system, but I, I note Mr. Yu's point. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's a magic bullet answer to, to his concerns. It, it, it is an issue that obviously everyone in the administrative justice system is alive. Alyssa, my question is a little bit simpler. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, you know, how is it that people will find out about this whole system? You know, if it's voluntary, we want people to know about it. Other than kind of through the Solution Explorer, um, how will people find out that they can actually participate in it? Yeah, and that's a, that's a really good point. We don't have an advertising budget, but, or at least one to speak of, but we are working to identify ways to get to where people would be making the choice about whether to pursue a claim in a small claims court or to use the CRT. So focusing on registries, making sure that there's advertising, that court registry staff can identify it as an option, making sure that our frontline advocates community that deal with people day-to-day uh, -day have letters um, and cards on site as well to give people information about how we're implementing this, how we're consulting, and also to get feedback from the public. Uh, we're also trying to, you, to go through public libraries people use treat public libraries as one of their primary points to use the internet and to access the avenue we're pursuing. But we're open to ideas. So if you have great ideas to help us get the word out, that's really important to us. Because as you say, um, uptake is important and we need to get people through the system in order to test it and refine the model as much as possible. Thanks, Thanks so much. Jen, I've got a little bit of a follow-up question. Um, it's Sharuk Darwala who's online and is asking a, a little bit more about the qualifications for the facilitators um, and adjudicators. So if um, either group needs to have a lot and can qualified mediators who are not lawyers or arbitrators become adjudicators? So good question. So, so two parts of the question. On the adjudicator side, the position requires a law degree. And the reason is that this is work that will previously have been done by judges. And it requires a, a high degree of legal knowledge because what you're doing is taking case law, uh, statutes, legislation, and applying it to evidence that you have to weigh and consider in the case. So it's a very legal exercise, augmented by expertise, obviously, in the subject matter areas. And I think that's important given the fairly judicial, quasi-judicial nature of the work that the tribunal's doing. On the facilitator and case manager side, though, there is not a requirement to have a law degree. Really what we're focused on there is the ability of the person to resolve disputes, go away their, their dispute resolution skills, with their ability to manage a caseload effectively and reasonably. Um, you know, if you are, and obviously there is an advantage to have some ex expertise in the subject matter areas. Um, to teach the, the legal framework, what we need are people who have resolution skills. And that's what we're looking for. Absolutely, I know you have it's kind of a follow-up to the, the question, it, Lee Turnbull, question about the, it's really the case facilitators, I think, that the most concern in terms of um, people not making, making agreements that perhaps they have uh, remorse about later. And so what, at what point, if any, let's, let's take the small claims court where it's voluntary and not have the strata for the minute. Can they back up and go back to the small claims court even kind of get into that case management section? You say, okay, so they could do the exploring, you know, and then they get in and case manager or something. Can they kind of go, oh, I don't like that, and go back? No. <laughs> okay. no. So what once can they you, do about that? Okay, so once you've returned <laughs> to the jurisdiction of the tribunal, and that's just a fact, once you've agreed to use the tribunal, somebody has invited you and you've agreed, um, you can't get halfway through the, through the process and say, Ugh, I don't like the way this is going. It doesn't look like I'm going to be successful here and fail. Um, that's, that's not going to work. So in order to leave the process, once you've agreed to use it, you need uh, consent of both parties or permission from the tribunal. But there, there are going to be safeguards to ensure against things like undue influence, <coughs> um, uh, duress, those kinds of things. And, and one of the roles of the tribunal uh, member when they receive a draft agreement is to do a little bit of due diligence about that to say so that this, this doesn't 
quite look right or it doesn't smell right to me. I need to ask more questions and find out. So it won't be the case that tribunal members simply rubber stamp draft agreements that they get from case managers or facilitators. There will be a, um, a, a basic due diligence exercise there to make sure that there are, to the best you can in that capacity, um, rapidly unfair agreements. So, you know, that, that, again, so much I think will really depend on the training and the, uh, the business processes and the code of conduct and the requirements that we set out in the tribunal, those things. And those Lee's first just, question. Just wait till you get up here. All right. Well, <laughs> um, it sounded as if you're going to have the facilitators or uh, uh, case managers size up the parties and decide uh, where there's an inequity and, in a sense, advocate for one party and point them in the right direction legislation and so on. Um, does that concern you? Um, I want to be clear, it's not the case that the case manager or facilitator is an advocate for one party or the other. That said, if they are identifying qualities that they think make facilitation not an appropriate process in that circumstance, then that's something they will have to address. Uh, in a sense by, of stopping it? or Yes, by stopping it. So part of having those flexible processes is that not every case has to go through facilitation. Not every case has to right. go through every phase. Some cases may jump directly from intake to adjudication, right. either because out of experience we know that that particular case is not very amenable to facilitation, or because of the nature of the parties and any concerns like the ones you've identified and that we identified. All right. <laughs> <laughs> <If he> can, <laughs> if the facilitator can't negotiate a settlement between the parties, right. like a mediator, right. and then if it says here, can decide dispute with consent, mm -hmm. can the mediator then say, well, I mean, if you'd like, I can decide it for you. And then if, if the parties agree to that, then the facilitator, case manager decides it. Yeah, that is what the legislature, and that's built into flexibility. And I know for um, some of you in the, in the mediation community that, that that's not an approach you would take or it's something you would be comfortable with. It's something that's provided for in the act, and it's something, uh, it's a tool among many, that, that are available to facilitators. Like all these tools, though, there are going to have to be parameters of, around their use. There have to be um, a lot of discussion about training about that because as well. So that's something that we have to think about and be careful about. Okay. Yeah. I was going to speak to you afterwards about this anyway, but on, the, on that talk, on that our approaches, mm -hmm. The timing is good because Mediate BC is just setting up through its roster committee a little working group to uh, develop best practice guidelines for MedArc That's in the helpful. province. And it's a tricky issue, it, especially when you have people who aren't necessarily sophisticated um, and understanding the implications of what they're doing there. So um, we are co uh, cooperating with BCMI on that. We've got two people from BCMI to work with Carter Lee. So that's great. That's really posted. helpful, Carrie. Yeah. And, you know, um, uh, Carrie and I have been in communication since I've been appointed, and I, you know, Mediate BC is a huge resource to us. And you know, they they've been in the the dispute resolution in a small claims context, and of course other contexts for many years. And there's a lot that we can learn from their experience, and also from the experience of the ODR pilot that's uh, ongoing now. So um, we know that that's a huge resource, and we to draw on it and that's part of asking for feedback um, coming to you for help because we don't have all the answers yet so uh, that's going to be something we'll, we'll look to for advice so I'd be interested to hear that uh, report. I'm out of online questions so if, <laughs> if anybody does have questions my mom is watching online and I'm kind of relieved her on <laughs> yeah. her online questions yeah, I haven't had any from her yet it's she's <laughs> a mediator <laughs> I was watching for her name to pop up <laughs> She has tough questions too. Ah, yeah. uh, she doesn't want to get you on the spot here. Uh, <laughs> um, we are getting some very, very nice compliments about the uh, presentation so far, oh, though I'm not it. sharing those. I'll just say we're getting some lovely comments, but uh, hopefully I'll be able to share those after. Um, if there are no further questions, though, I may just take a moment here, step in, and just talk about the next events to make sure everybody knows what is coming up, um, and then um, we can we can offer. And if you came up with a last second question, you'll have a chance to ask on the way out. Well, thank you all, all of you for your for your attention and for, yeah. for your interest. I'm really excited to hear your comments as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon.
Um, we've got a few and everybody's got a handout, um, but I just want to emphasize for those of you who may not already be core members or, or might not have attended any of the events in the past, um, we do run eight, uh, eight a year. Um, so it's structured as a speaker series. The next three are settled. We know the topics of the four after that, and I can answer questions about them, but um, the ones that are we have the details for are the next three that you see. Um, and so I want to encourage you to come out here. We're going to be testing the live streaming. So for those of you watching the live stream, we'll be putting out some information around work in the next couple as well. Um, but we've got Ray Williams coming out and doing I the Storm, How Mindful Leaders Navigate Chaotic Workplaces. And it should be a fantastic um, different change of pace event for those of you who are interested in learning a little bit more about mindfulness. We're bringing in somebody who is not coming from the mediation community, but bringing a different kind of expertise um, and coaching experience, and I think that you'll get a lot out of being able to bring that to your um, Arlene Henry, many of you will know, um, has long time been involved in children's participation and dispute resolution. She's now doing um, parenting coordinating as well as the work that she's done. In she's also going to be addressing questions around children's participation in other types of disputes, um, personal injury, any kind of place where the voice of a child might you might want to bring it to bear in a discussion. So she's going to talk about what's happening in that area. And then in April, we've got Colleen Cattell and Howard Nemton teaming up to do what should be a really interesting session. Um, it doesn't say here, but it will involve an hour of CPD credit for ethics, for those of you who are counting your ethics hours, um, because what they're talking about is be making best use of the mediator. So it's going yeah, what are those practices and how do you use the mediator? Um, obviously, that's going to encounter questions of manipulating. Um, what and, and therefore, we'll definitely dabble in different ethical issues around what are appropriate ways of engaging with the mediator. And, what do you and for, it'll be interesting for mediators to be able to hear what are the recommendations being made by mediation advocates for mediating the process. So those are the next three. So I encourage you to come out to them. And on that note, I'm going to just say a huge thank you to Shannon. Really appreciate you coming out. We're hoping that we'll be able to post this so that it might be available for others. Um, and we'll send out notices to all of you if that happens so you can share it and tell, tell other people. It was great. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Well, thank you.